Welcome to Complexity Made Simple. My name is Paul Allen and today the subject of today's newsletter is this diagram here. Process thinking. You can see we've had a slight change of uh, we've had a slight change of venue for today because I need to I need to work on the table with some dice. Um, and dice, whenever I'm trying to get the, the principle across to people, the idea of process thinking and how important it is to understand inputs and outputs and how multiple inputs, multiple variables affect your process, affect your ability to problem solve, etc. I like to use dice because it just takes all the technicality away, takes all the physics out the way and we're able to just understand it from a very simple set of numbers. So today we're going to take a look at process thinking. Now just before we get into the video, uh, just a reminder, uh, if you want to know more about this principle, other Six Sigma tools, my book, drink tea and read the paper, it's all in there in the same sort of understandable way as I'm about to put it across now. So drink tea and read the paper if you wish to know more. Uh, also, take the Six Sigma challenge. This is the centerpiece of what I do. This is the centerpiece of Six Sigma. This is the centerpiece of a black belt or a green belt's capability. Process thinking, inputs and outputs. If you ask me to come to your factory to fix a technical problem. I'm going to turn up and use this. Uh, it's very simple and easy to use. And consequently, it's, it's based on the laws of physics as far as I'm concerned, it will work. If I turn up to your factory to fix a technical problem and I don't fix it, you don't have to pay me. That's the Six Sigma challenge. So if you want to take the Six Sigma challenge, please leave a comment in the boxes below or if you've got any other points or videos that you'd like me to make then please leave a comment as it's very helpful uh, to promote the channel. But let's get into this material, let's get into this principle, the idea of process thinking, the idea of variables. Now what I've got here is a process with, with 10 variables, 10 inputs to the process. Now the way I'm going to represent those 10 inputs is with 10 dice. Okay, so of course, if we start rolling the dice, counting up the numbers, we get we get some result here. So we'd end up with some we'd end up with some total, some measure uh, that we're that we're interested in. And of course, one of the first things to realise about having having ten variables like this and, and having them as dice, because it's easy to understand them as dice is the idea that the normal distribution will appear. And this, this is why the normal distribution should be in your processes. Because if you think about it, how often will I roll 10 ones? Well, that's gonna be a very lucky day at the office. It's probably a one in a million chance that I would roll 10 ones, and therefore I would get the number 10 as a total. Of course, on the other end, how often will I roll 60? How often will I roll 10 sixes? Well, that's a similar rare event. So of course, out at the tails, it's a very rare result. How often could I roll something around 35? Well, there's many different ways. There's many, many combinations that these variables can, can add together to generate the middle number, 35. Many different ways. So in other words, I get lots of data at the middle. I get very little data at the extremes. What do I end up with? I end up with a normal distribution. Now let's just play that straight into your processes. You've got 10 variables, you might have 20 variables, 30 variables. If they're all bouncing around randomly, how often will you be unlucky enough for them all to hit the bottom? How often would you be unlucky enough for them all to hit the top? It's going to be a rare day at the office. What's going to happen most of the time? Well, they're going to be somewhere in the middle. So you're going to get lots of middle results. What should you be getting? What should you be seeing? If a little bit of normality is in place, you should see the normal distribution. That's, that's a sign that just 
luck is playing into your variables. If you see some other shape that's very scattered and fragmented, that's a very bad sign to be seen. So that's the first thing to be thinking about. That's how the normal should play through your results. But I want to think about how problem solving works because we're often taught we've got to find the root cause. Something's happened. We've got to find the root cause of why my process is, is moving, is misbehaving. So let's think about this for a second. Look, if I roll, if I roll the the dice now. Let's draw a little graph here. So if I roll the dice, 10 down here is the, the minimum, 60 is the maximum. Now let's say I was lucky enough to roll some relatively small number, maybe around about 20. So I land down here. Of course, tomorrow, when I run the same process and the variables move about in a random path, suddenly I roll a much bigger number. Okay, so let's say 49. Of course, the process moves dramatically. And we're there thinking, what's the root cause? What's the root cause? Now, we have a suspicion that the root cause is this red variable here. This is what caused the problem. But, of course, the shift was over 20 points and of course we know because we, we're rolling dice that this single dice can't do that so we we wouldn't make that mistake when we're rolling dice we wouldn't look for a root cause we'd very quickly realize this doesn't have a root cause this is what Stewart would call common cause variability so common cause Another way to think about that is all the variables are moving. And if all the variables are moving, that's quite complicated. What you're looking at typically is chaos, you know? If I keep rolling these dice, they move in a random pattern. What's another word for a random pattern? It's chaos. When you have common cause, when you have common cause movements in your process, there is no, there is no root cause. This is multi-causal. What do you have to do? Well, you have to take it a variable at a time and you have to control these. You have to fix them, bear down on their movement, put rules in place, put an SLP in place. But what you have to do is to fix them as much as you reasonably can. Now let's say we've done that. Here's a couple of examples of some green variables that we've controlled. Look, and suddenly the green variables, well, most of what's on here are fours. There's the occasional five. I can't get rid of all the variability sometimes in my variables, but now these dice are only moving between four and five. So they're hardly moving at all. Okay, now then. What am I going to see now? Well, now I'm going to see a very stable result. I'm going to see a process that is under control because a process that's under control, one of the things you can do is control the common cause variability. And now, of course, I've taken a lot of these wild swings out of there. Now, if I suddenly get some movement of course it's very easy to see the root cause because that will be one variable the chance that all nine of my dice will all go back to that crazy performance we had in the earlier the early performance the fact that all of these ver all these controls would be missing all on the same day that's not going to happen so now we have a root cause now we can find a root cause Root cause is only findable, it's only worth looking when the process has been controlled. What does that mean? You've come up with ways of controlling as many of the inputs as you reasonably can. Now, 
Do we behave like this naturally? Well, no, we don't behave like this naturally because unfortunately, and this is why I use dice and not an example from a process, processes aren't as simple as this because this process is not what I would call transformational. When this dice increases by one, of course, it will affect the total by one. Yeah, so it's a straight, easy to understand relationship from the input to the output. But let's say we have a manufacturing process. Let's say this is an easy one to put on here. It's a molding process. Well, now what we've got, of course, is I have temperature. I might have temperature of the front tool. I might have temperature of the back tool. I might have temperature of the plastic. I might have time, injection time, holding time, cooling time, many, many variables. Now these are times and temperatures. What do they transform into? They might transform into the dimension of the part at the other end here. So suddenly we have seconds transforming into millimeters. Now that's not so easy to understand. It's not so easy to understand the variability. So of course what happens when we see a big shift we go looking for a root cause and we say there's the reason. It's this time, it's this temperature. It's this control. And we jump to a huge conclusion. We can only go looking for root cause in controlled processes, single variables that have slipped out of control. If you go looking for a root cause in this chaos, when all of these variables are being allowed to move all around like these dice, it doesn't have a root cause. You will spend years and I'm sure this has never happened to you you've never tried to fix a problem the problems disappeared mainly because look made it go somewhere good and then the problems reappeared a few weeks later I'm sure that's never happened and you've tried to fix it again and the problem disappears why is that because you're not fixing the root cause you're just watching chaos at play inputs outputs variability and the relationship of variables and how well they are controlled defines what type of problem solving technique you use. If you have chaos, multiple causes, you have to spend three months fixing those. Three months is as fast as it will take you. If on the other hand you have a fantastically well controlled process and one thing goes wrong because one control will fall out of will fall out of favor they won't all go all on the same day now you have a root cause that could take you a, as little as five minutes to fix it five minutes for root cause three months to deal with chaos the two techniques are completely different to one another one is very quick and easy you can use five ways in your root cause analysis one needs a very different analysis. Process flow, cause and effect. You need to identify all these variables. You need to decide whether you've got good SLPs in place. And then it's going to take you three months to devise and control the, the variables. So, process thinking. It is the centerpiece of every tool you use in Six Sigma. It is actually the centerpiece of every tool you use, whether you use Six Sigma or Deming or Duran or any other technique, or Schuert for that matter. Schuert based all his thoughts on this technique, on this, on this principle. It is the centerpiece of every tool you will use. It helps you to decide what action to take, and it also helps you to decide the right action. Because if you take the wrong action, if you spend three minutes trying to fix a problem when you should be taking three months, it won't work. It won't work. Process thinking. It is the centerpiece of Six Sigma. It is the centerpiece of process improvement. 
if you want to take the Six Sigma Challenge, I'll turn up with this principle and I'll fix your technical problem. Um, otherwise, leave some comments below. Be great to hear from you.